Good morning. Welcome back to class number six, the final class in our Young Poets Workshop. Hope you've enjoyed these uh, brief videos. There's more to come after this, but this will be the last session in this particular workshop. Now, in the last class, which was how to write a bad poem, just at the end there, I mentioned that this class would be all about your poetry. And so some of you, mostly uh, kids in Mrs. Angeli's seventh grade class in Temecula, California, submitted poems, and I chose seven or eight of the ones I enjoyed most, and I'm going to read and analyze those poems today. And I think in doing that, you're going to have a chance to learn quite a bit from their poetry. Now, these were the rules that I set up at the end of that class number five. The students in Mrs. Angeli's class had exactly 30 minutes to write these poems, which makes them flash poetry. Flash poetry means poetry you do very quickly. And um, like I've always told you throughout this course, it will take me weeks and sometimes months to put together a good poem. 30 minutes is not very much time, but still I am incredibly impressed by the quality of the poems that were submitted to me. So those were the rules. And um, let's see what they came up with. Now, oh, by the way, I should mention that this quarantine business has been very tough. Uh, I know it has for all you students, young people watching. Uh, I admire the fact that you are still watching this, keeping your brain active because it hasn't always been easy, right? Um, various people have gone through lots of different states of depression. People have lost their jobs. It has not been easy. And so I applaud you for staying busy with your schoolwork as much as possible. And I think we're going to have a great summer, in fact, here in California, in Riverside County, they just announced the opening of all the retail stores, the mall, and all the restaurants for sit-down dining. So the end of this crisis is not quite here, but I can see it from here. All right, I'm going to start with a poem by Adam Free. Adam wrote a poem called The Beach. So there it is up on the screen. You can see it's three stanzas. So I'm going to read this poem. You can follow along with me as, you, as I go. All right. The Beach by Adam Free. The land began to touch water as the stars appeared in the sky. We were here before the sunset, but the moon's glow was already nigh. We chose to build a fire, and the shore became the hearth. The heat was growing steadily as the starlight hit the earth. Crashing waves had made us stay while the sun had been gone for hours. The smoke was the heat, the sand was the beach, but the friendship we made had been ours. All right, so that was the beach. A very impressive poem, especially considering it was written in roughly 30 minutes, as all these poems that I'm going to read today were. Very tight structure, three stanzas. Um, the rhyming is very clear. He's rhyming every second and fourth line, as you can see. Um, it's, a, it's a narrative poem, I'd say. He, it's lyrical. In other words, it's got a lot of musicality and lots of beautiful images and everything. But he's also telling a story about his trip to the beach. Now, um, some things that I really like about this poem, it's roughly eight, 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 eight um, in, um, syllables per line. It's got a an unpredictable meter, so it's not iambic, but it's it's um, a, a different sort of meter because um, he didn't have very much time to write that. So some of the lines have nine beats, some have ten, some have eight, some have seven, some have six, but uh, I think it all holds together very well. One image I really like is the shore became the hearth. So you get this image of a fire on on the shore or near the shore in front of the ocean. And a hearth is a fireplace normally. You know, you make your, your hearth there and you put the fire. But his hearth was the entire shore. Just, I just love that. Um, hearth, hearth and earth, that would be an, a near rhyme. I think it really works well. There's a lot of, remember, assonance sound, that rhyming vowel sound and rhyming consonant sound, that, that the TH sound in hearth and earth. And then he comes to a conclusion in that last bit. And what did he get from this? Friendship. I, I love the image in those last two lines. The smoke was the heat. So the heat created the smoke. The smoke belonged to the heat. 
The sand belonged to the beach, but the friendship made at that fire, that belonged to the people who were there. So I think it's a very beautiful um, metaphor and um, some great images. Really well done, Adam. Great poem. The next poem I'm going to discuss is a poem by Alexis Bazelon, or Bazelon, named, uh, called Ruined Heroine. I wanted a charming prince all for me, a dashing lover like a sweet tea. I searched for him with hopeful glee. This would never be enough, you see, for I was dyed with fairy tale dream. My Cinderella castle and my shiny Snow White's apple, so naive I wished for it to be. I held those innocent childhood dreams and ripped them apart right at the seams. The stained, bittersweet poisoned me, filled with mischief, softly breathed. The role of heroine is all for me. A very interesting poem. Um, uh, again, I don't see a, a very clear rhyme scheme, um, but that's fine. We've got the rhyming lines in that first uh, stanza. They all rhyme. The, the, the end um, word rhymes. Me, T, Glee, C. So carries it on to the next stanza, which is only a, a, a two-line stanza. Then we go back to the three-line, then two-line, then three-line. So there is a structure here, and I think it's very interesting. Um, you've got the assonance, the rhyming vowel sounds, C and dream. Um, but what is the image here? It's a, it's a child's imagery. Uh, where you where this girl, uh, the narrator in the poem, it's not necessarily Alexis, but this narrator in the poem is wishing for a, a prince, Prince Charming, like out of a fairy tale, which she mentions there. And she was hoping for this, this prince. And I love the image. She was dyed with fairy tale dreams. So the dream had dyed her, I guess stained her, with these dreams. Are those dreams positive? Well, we'll get to that. So then in that middle, that third stanza, she mentions that she wishes for the Cinderella's castle, Snow White's apple. So she's alluding to all these famous stories of, of um, true love. And then she says, it's so naive that I wished for that. And now she's in that fourth paragraph, we see a turn here. Now she's, now she's saying, I held those innocent dreams. Can you hold a dream in your hand? No, it's a very interesting metaphor. She's considering the dream and she ripped it apart at the seam. So it's as though the dream is a, is a piece of paper or book. And by ripping it, she's getting rid of those dreams. And then she listens to a third, another voice, maybe her inside voice, mischief voice, filled with mischief, stained, bittersweet. And that voice softly breathes to her. So there's some personification, I guess, here. The role of heroine is all for me. So now she's going to become, she doesn't need a Prince Charming to rescue her or anything. She's going to become her own uh, Prince Charming, I guess, or she's going to take care of her own um, destiny. Very surprising conclusion. I really liked it. A lot of classical references, a lot of images. Um, just especially, I love that fourth stanza there, ripping your, your dream at the seams. Our next poem is by a girl named Abigail Handojo, and the poem is called Life is Like the Sky. Feel the wind blow through my hair like birds who just learned to fly, soaring up without one care faster than the blink of an eye. Even during the hopeless night, we zoom towards luminous stars, not stopping nor turning right until we're on the planet Mars. The wings of faith send me to the sky, and hasten my way through the light. Before I know it's time to say a goodbye and meet my creator at the end of my flight. Okay, very powerful poem. Mysterious a bit. Um, is it a dream? Uh, is it a wish? I don't know. It's, it's, it's unclear, and that's good. It's ambiguous, like a lot of poems are. Very nice structure to the poem. You can see the three stanzas. Um, very tight rhyming. Every other line rhymes, or every every line rhymes with the, the first rhyme rhymes with the second line. So it's an A, B, A, B structure. Hair, fly, care, eye. And she more or less follows that down all the way. Um, 
she paid a lot of attention to the syllable count, the meter, so it's a very clear meter. It's more or less seven or eight uh, syllables or beats um, in the first two stanzas. She sort of gets away from it at the end. She's got 10 syllables in that last, second to last line in the third stanza and 12 in the final one, but really it works no matter what. I love the metaphor that's created in the um, second stanza there during the hopeless night. What does she mean by the hopeless night? Maybe her life. It seems like we're working with an extended metaphor here. She's not just talking about a night or one night. She's talking about her whole life, I think. And she zooms toward luminous stars. What a wonderful, rich word, luminous, meaning filled with light. Um, and zoom, of course, is onomatopoeia. Uh, and uh, some very rich imagery. We had some Im uh, similes in the first uh, stanza as well. The, the wind blows through her hair, the bird, like birds who just learned to fly. And then finally, she comes to a kind of a conclusion. What sends her to the sky? Was it her dream? It was the wings of faith. Wings of faith, very interesting metaphor there. So her faith brings her up there and she hastens through the light. And before it's time to say a goodbye, goodbye to, goodbye to what? Well, it's clear. Her flight is her life. And meet my creator at the end of her flight. So in the dream, she's going to Mars. But I think she turns it in that last stanza. And really what she's doing is she's flying through life. And as the light fades or she's going toward light, and she's saying goodbye, and her flight is her life. It's a very rich, beautiful imagery and uh, metaphor. Excellent job, Abigail. Okay, so now I would like to do a short poem. This one is by Caleb Fawn, and it's called Harsh. Different poem from the last one, you'll see. <clears throat> Harsh by Caleb Fawn. We lost some things. We took some things. We wanted things, but do not cry. We shattered things. We kept some things. We cried for things, but we must try. We flew from things. We stopped some things. We tried some things, but we'll be fine. All right. Now, the other poems were ambiguous and interesting and layered. This one is very odd, and I mean weird in a good way. I don't know what it means. Um, but it is hypnotic, and it sort of gets you into almost a trance. And he does that through the main technique that he uses of repetition. Lots of strong verbs. He wanted to use those verbs, lost, took, wanted, cry, shattered. And he goes down this uh, three stanza poem, um, the, the fourth line of every stanza rhymes with the fourth line of every stanza. So they all rhyme, except for that last one, fine, doesn't rhyme with try, but you've got that rich assonance, that uh, long I sound. Um, he's capitalizing every word. Um, Emily Dickinson often did that. It's very eccentric, very strange, but I kind of like it. And um, at the end, I have no idea what is going on in this poem. It does sound like a vision of, of trying to get something out of your life and failing and succeeding at different times. And at the end, there's this message of hope. You know, all these things happen. We cry, we try, we'll be fine. Sounds like a quarantine poem to me, because um, isn't that what we're all doing? We're just trying to get through this. Sometimes we're crying, but uh, and we're trying and doing all sorts of crazy things. So Really ambiguous, interesting poem. Great job, Caleb. Uh, for our next poem, a young woman named Claudia Flores, and it's called The Boy Tree. I study this tree standing before me, never know how high it can truly be, until I take a climb on his steady branches. May I feel the sky priceless as many mansions Day after day, he never move, and wonder if he feels any solitude. As my life goes on, so does its. However, he never experiences any of his. Instead, it sits there sad as a depressed little boy that has just lost his favorite toy. What goes on inside his tree-type mind, only the most patient of people can find. Looks just like any other tree, 
but not just every other tree has his different personality. Funny how good of a friend a tree can be. All right, so um, just one big stanza and a very interesting poem. Has uh, a rhyme scheme that it seems to be built in couplets. You can see each um, the two lines rhyme with each other. So we've got me and B, branches and mansions, which is an interesting rhyme. <laughs> That's called a near rhyme, but I, I kind of like it here. It sounds good. Move, solitude. So those are rhymes that don't necessarily, they're kind of cheat rhymes, but that's okay. You've got that assonant sound, makes it sound great. Um, it's an, a lot of personification. That's her main technique here. She's creating this, this image of a tree. She's, she's, she's climbing up. She doesn't know the tree or how high it is until she climbs into its branches. And then she sees the sky priceless as many mansions. I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful image. And then she starts to wonder if the tree experiences solitude. And then she says, no, it doesn't. But then she gives this really interesting um, simile that he sits there as sad as a, as a depressed little boy. We're sensing different themes in these poetry, but certainly depression, contemplation is, is part of it. I think this narrator, who might be Claudia, is coming to contemplate this tree in a totally different way than people normally contemplate trees, right? How interesting, such a clever poem. And then she wonders what goes on inside his tree-type mind. Only the patient, most patient people can find that out. I just think that's beautiful. Who are the patient people? Poets, maybe? Scientists who study trees? People who climb trees? Who knows? Um, and then she concludes that every tree has a different personality and how amazing a, a, it is to have a, a friend, how good a friend a tree can be. So lots of uh, imagery created through all sorts of wonderful things. We see some alliteration. Only the most patient of people can find. So um, in all, a very interesting poem. And I think if Claudia wanted to spend another hour with this poem, cleaning it up, maybe figuring out the, the meter a little bit better because her meter has 10 beats in the first line and then 12 beats in the third line and then there's 8 beats and 15 beats. So what she would do is in an editing, she might go back and sort of clean things up, or she might not feel like doing that. Maybe she wants to push the uh, idea of all these irregular beats and make this much more of a free verse poem rather than a formal poem that, that, uh, that rhymes and has uh, a regular meter. We're going to do a poem that is an untitled poem by Kiara Richardson. I really enjoyed this poem, found it very interesting. Their words like waves crashing and breaking on us as they float on a ship of their perfection. We reach longing for what they have. Instead, the waves take us, making us feel as though we are worthless. We get dragged back into the tide, under the pressure to change into the image they have set for us. When we reach for it, we get lost in their expectations, too great for us to live up to. Wow. Okay. This poem, unlike the other poems we've read, is completely free verse, as far as I can tell. She's, she's not really trying to rhyme too much. Uh, there, you can see each of the lines is a, more or less a different length. So she's not focusing on um, uh, a formal structure. She, she's using free verse, which is fine and good. Um, she enjoys alliteration and assonance, and that's what she's pushing in this poem. So at the beginning, we've got that simile interesting metaphor as they float on a ship of their perfection. So this is an image of the, the author, the writer, or, or she's advising people saying, look, we, we compare ourselves to others. It makes us feel miserable. It makes us drown, dragged back into the tide, dragged back. Hear that assonant sound? And then we get lost in their expectations. Again, it's sort of a, a related metaphor to the sea metaphor. And then we've got the front central metaphor at the beginning uh, of the waves crashing and breaking. So you've got this image of drowning by your comparisons. And um, it doesn't end happily, which is fine. I think it ends uh, with a question. You know, this is what happens to us if we are always envying somebody else. Um, let's see. I love the alliteration at the beginning. They're wave words like waves crashing, breaking on us. Um, really wonderful stuff. Really strong poem. Great job, Kiara.
Now, here is perhaps our most sophisticated poem, and I just am amazed that this was written in 30 minutes, because it's um, most of these poems, I mean, they're all wonderful, and the other ones that I did not read, I should point out, are wonderful as well, but I could only choose so many, and so I chose these. So this is a poem by uh, Catherine Tice, and um, there's a lot going on here. I can't possibly uh, analyze it all. So let me read the poem. Untitled by Catherine Tice. The sun fills your sight with blinding white light until submersion under green-blue tides, diving deep into depths where something hides, further and further in unexplored turf, from green to blue to black, black nothingness. A sharp, bright glare pierces through oblivion. The strange creature's eyes stare through to your soul. Jaws separate, needle-sharp teeth peer through, Paralyzed, afraid with nothing to do, with a pop, hiss, and a sickening crunch, sinister teeth break unprotected skin. Cries of terror muffled by salted brine, heavy maws clamp down, and before too long, none left of your body, completely gone. All right, a very scary image. Again, another image about the ocean. We've had three about the ocean. Um, and this is, um, uh, it's 14 lines, which is usually a sonnet's length, and this kind of has a lot in common with sonnets. There's, there's 10 beats per line, which is a Shakespearean sonnet length, but in other ways it differs. Uh, let's start from the top. Right away, she's got a lot of alliteration there. The sun fills your sight. So you've got the S, 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 S and then you've got a lot of um, assonance sound and rhyming. Uh, sight, blind, white light. So she's got some internal rhymes there. So is this a person? Is this her consciousness? Is she imagining uh, it as a, a fish, a fellow fish? And then um, some great imagery, a sharp, bright glare. She's using monosyllables, very powerful, uh, evenly with even beats. Sharp, bright glare pierces through oblivion. Nice metaphor. Um, and then you've got that onomato onomatopoeia, my favorite word, with the pop and the hiss and the sickening crunch. Oh, she put all that in there. Such rich words. Catherine obviously loves words. She's got turf in here. She's got the sickening crunch and unprotected and salted brine. And she even uses the word maws, which means your, your jaws, your mouth, um, there in that second to the last line. And it's a super scary image. And it ends you know, in death, completely gone nothing left of your body. So now it seems that it's not a fish, it's, it's us. So it's, it's a dream. Um, very, it's a narrative poem telling a story. Extremely, um, extremely beautiful um, images and uh, words that she's using in here. Very sophisticated. Great job, Catherine. Finally, we're going to end on this poem because I think it's probably the most appropriate poem in many ways. Um, to end this session, which um, has been during this wonderful time of quarantine. I hope we're going to be able to um, get back to normal soon. Uh, but Katie Minier in this poem called The Invisible Enemy really captures, I think, what a lot of us are feeling, which is what poets do often, right? They, they're able to articulate what we're all thinking and feeling, but they do it in a, in a very uh, lyrical, powerful compressed language sort of way. I want to read her poem. The Invisible Enemy by Katie Minier. The enemy that keeps you up at night, yet every time you turn away it strikes. The enemy that keeps us stuck as you try to run away. You get slapped in the face with a reality I want to forget. As if you can turn away from someone banging on your door. As I reach out for others, I get pulled back into purgatory. That's all life is nowadays. Is this our new normal? Or will there be a day when evil is defeated? One day we will be able to leave. One day we will look back on our experience and smile, knowing that it is all over. One day there will be people dancing in the streets, singing with joy. One day the world will be colorful again. One day. This is free verse, 
She doesn't divide it into stanzas or anything. There's not a clear meter. Um, it, there's not much rhyming that I could see at all. Uh, she's just expressing strong emotions and she's using lots of techniques though. For example, um, we've got personification throughout the enemy. What is the enemy? The coronavirus, I guess, the quarantine perhaps, maybe it's our fear perhaps, and it's keeping us up at night. And she follows that metaphor um, for most of the poem. So we've got this image of this person who's keeping us up at night and then she tries to, it's, it's slapping her in the face. It's banging on her door, which is great. How can you turn away from someone banging on your door? Obviously, is the quarantine, is the virus doing this to us? No, but metaphorically, it really is, right? We're all uh, more anxious, more worried than we normally are. And so she gets pulled back into purgatory. So now we've got a different image going, a period of being stuck someplace in between two other places. And... That's our new normal. We've heard that a lot. So we've got alliteration with the new normal. Then the poem turns a bit and we get an image, uh, a more hopeful conclusion of this, of this poem. Or is there one day, now she starts the repetition, or is there one day where evil is defeated? One day we will be able to leave. And she repeats one day, one day, one day, like five more times. Very powerful, like a bell, right? Ring a bell again. And again, that's what repetition does. Um, Edgar Allan Poe used it to great effect, as, uh, as many others do. And you've got this beautiful image of people dancing the street. And then she ends with that last image. Our world will be colorful again. What does that mean? I mean, isn't the world as colorful as it always is? It's got grass and blue skies and all that stuff. No, she's talking about psychologically and for all of us, joy. That makes the world colorful. And then she ends with that one day, just like an alone there at the end. Very powerful poem that to me really spoke to my feelings about how um, difficult the quarantine has been. But I think we're emerging from it now. And I think the world will be colorful very soon, Katie. And that's it. Thank you guys for watching these videos. I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you, St. Jean de Lestinac, uh, for submitting all your wonderful poems. I enjoyed many of the ones that I, I was not able to discuss today. They were all powerful, um, but uh, I hope you uh, have a good time. Write some poems, read some poetry this summer. Uh, enjoy it. It's there to be enjoyed. There are thousands of friends that you haven't met that are in the books, uh, maybe on your parents' shelf or in the library or through Amazon. Find some poems, read them, start writing some poems of your own. All right. Thank you so much again and adios.